Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to celebrate the launch of Hops, a photographic history of Oregon's hopscape by Kenneth Halpan. My name is Marty. I'm the marketing manager at Oregon State University Press. I want to thank Tia Edmondson Morton of the Oregon Hops and Brewing Archives for moderating and Special Collections and Archives Research Center at OSU for co-sponsoring tonight's event. As you're settling in, please check your microphones and make sure that they're turned off. If you have questions or comments during the presentation for either Kenny or Tia, please enter them in the chat window anytime. You can put them in the public chat or send them directly to me. It's your choice. Um, I'll be monitoring those comments and I'll pass them along. Um, Kenny's going to give a presentation and Tia will join him in some archivist talk and we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be posted to the OSU Press YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, I want to mention that we experienced a slight delay in getting books from our printer, but the shipment is on track for delivery to our warehouse this week. Thank you to Mickey Riemann, our fabulous EVP manager. Um, I'll be sharing a promo code through the chat window that's good for 30% off and free shipping when you order the book through the OH2 Press website. That code will expire on October 35th, th sorry, October 31st, so please take advantage of it. So I'm going to introduce Kenny Helphand. Kenneth, Kenny, Kenneth I. Helphand is a Philip H. Knight Professor of Landscape Architecture Emeritus at the University of Oregon, where he taught courses in landscape history, theory, and design since 1974. He's a graduate of Brandeis University and Harvard's Graduate School of Design. He's the recipient of a Distinguished Teaching Awards from the University of Oregon and the Council of Education and Landscape Architecture. He's lectured at dozens of universities and is a professor at the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology. He's the author of numerous articles and reviews on topics on landscape history and theory with a particular interest in the contemporary American landscape. He's the author of the award-winning books, Colorado, Yard Street Park, Dreaming Gardens, Modern Israel, and Defiant Gardens, Making Gardens in Wartime. I'm just browsing through this. So without further ado, please welcome Kenny and Tia. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, um, me first? Okay. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Marty, and thank you, Tia. I'll be talking to you soon. Um, I wanna thank everyone for, for joining us for this short presentation about hops, historic photographs of the Oregon landscape. I know uh, lots of folks are out there and I can't thank you individually, although I start seeing friends out there and family and colleagues and some former students, but thank you for joining in. If you have any questions later that don't get answered during this, feel free to email me or text me. Uh, I was gonna suggest that everyone have a beer during this, but as I've often told folks, this book is not about, is about hops that flavor beer, but the book is not about beer. There are plenty of books about beer, but this is a rare book about hops. You're looking at the cover of the book. Um, okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, sorry, we just had a little glitch there. Okay, wait. Okay, things going in the right direction, good. <clears throat> I moved to Oregon about 50 years ago and first encountered hops. Unlike any other agricultural landscape I'd witnessed, I wanted to know more about this landscape and how it came to be, and I began to investigate. The research took me up by five to the Hops Archive at Oregon State University and meeting Tia and their extraordinary collection of photographs. That was the genesis of this book, which is a collection of historic photographs beginning in the 1880s of what I've termed the Oregon Hopscape, a word I invented to describe the physical environment and the broader culture of hops. However, what I discovered in the research was the culture of the hops environment and the rich relationship of people to that landscape. Okay, why is it? Uh -huh. Excuse me, wait, oh, there we go. Okay, okay. <clears throat> things weren't quite working, sorry. <laughs> um, each photo in the book has, <clears throat> sorry, each photo in the book has an accompanying caption, many of which are drawn from oral histories that I'll be quoting from. I'll be showing, folks, showing photographs of the book as I talk, but I'm not gonna explain them individually. I'll show many since they're the heart of the book. An article in the Sunday Oregonian in 1811 said, hop picking 
is the gayest, most carefree, easy money time in all the year. Poets and story writers have from time immemorial lauded the beauty of the hop fields and flung about them aromatic, aromatic interest. They deserve all the superlative in the market for the crop is one of the most beautiful grown. The long vines are festooned from post to crown and crowned with clusters of bell-like blossoms, marvelously delicate as to its shadings and wafting as gentle fragrance, grateful to the olfactory sense. The running vines completely embower the slackened wire from which hang pendant myriads of tips and tendrils <clears throat> that wave and beckon in the breeze that sweep across the mountaintops. They appear to be millions of welcoming hands bidding one to come and join the fun. The book begins with the plant and it spread through Western Oregon. And then the book traces all the stages of hops production and the creation of a hop yard or field through stringing, picking, baling, and the drying of hops. In this picture, you see an overview which shows most of these processes. You see a hop yard, you see the poles, you see the hops, you see the strings, you see the poles, you see people picking, you see bales of cotton being brought to the kiln. The construction of a hot yard is the first. The hundreds of poles are raised as a grid in the landscape, an incredible geometry on the ground. The book goes on to discuss the history of hop growing going back five centuries and tracing its migration from Europe to the United States and across the country to the Pacific Northwest until in the early decades of the 20th century, the Willamette Valley became the hops capital of the world. Once poles are, are placed, wires are strung across poles and then string is dropped to support the plants, which are called vines, not vines, that grow up to 20 feet in the season. Beth Monroe's father was a manager of the Lively Hop Yard located outside of Salem. Lively, in fact, <clears throat> became mayor of Salem and his grand house in Portland ultimately became, ultimately became the governor's mansion. In her oral history, she writes, I worked in the hop ranch from the time I was able to go outside and do any work at all. When school was out, we started with the training of the hops from the time that they came up out of the ground, you have to train them around the strings that take to the wire. Then my younger brother and I, when we were quite young, rode the sleds. Have you ever seen a hop sled? They're drawn by a horse, one horse per sled. They're probably six feet high. We climbed up on a ladder in the back, then we went between two rows and you would train the hops. Now hops grow in a certain way and you had to train them on the wires. The next, before mechanized picking was introduced around 1950, hop, pick, hop picking was an incredibly labor intensive process. It took three to four weeks and in the fall needed literally, literally tens of thousands of pickers that came to the fields in the Willamette Valley. They came from all the surrounding area as well as by trains that were commissioned and boats from Portland. They lived in temporary camps provided by growers. This one was just outside of Eugene. These photos shows these congregations of individuals, groups posing together, much like graduation pictures. They're in pairs, they're in groups, there's families, and they represented all walks of life. Many of these photographs are environmental portraits, people in the setting of their activity, often accompanied by the tools of their labor and craft. The landscape background in the picture becomes a subject equal to the individuals in the foreground. In a sense, the hop yard functions as a photographer's studio. In an era when painted backdrops were often used for formal portraits in a photographer's studio, the backdrop in these historic photographs is always out of doors with the poles and the plants of the hop yards as the backdrop. Look for close. In many pictures, you'll in fact see people with strands of hops wrapped around them. Hop fields, <clears throat> excuse me, an Oregonian, another Oregonian article here from 1907. Hop fields present one striking contrast to the city. There are no social barriers. Equality is maintained under the leveling action of the Wayman scale. Preacher and boot black, tradesman and farmer, factory hand and college boy pick side by side. The types ones meet represent every shade of mankind. Here is a school teacher with a college degree who's seeking health. Across from him is a town tramp earning money to buy beer. Here's the pretty daughter of the well-to-do farmer the hops in her basket to pay for a pale pink party dress. A tired, nervous little woman in the opposite row 
with all the energy of her body and her work. She's raising a mortgage. There are boys whose earnings put them through college and others who are raising money to go to the devil. These photographs have a celebratory aspect as a permanent record of people's participation in the season's harvest. Betsy Murphy in Corvallis said, I picked hops with my mother and younger brother. We got up fairly early in the morning in order to have time to help with the so-called chores on the farm. Prepare to eat breakfast, pack lunch, take it to the hop yard. My father fed and harnessed and picked up the horse and buggy. This is one of my favorite pictures here. Uh, I love the multi-generational quality of this. The boys, the, every age here, the boys playing with string from the hop yards and that Walt Whitman-like look-alike seating in his chair. Ma Martha Norton in her history says, I was raised in a large family, so everyone helped out. We'd get up around 5 a.m. and get the younger children dressed and ready for a day in the field, have breakfast, pack a large lunch. We loaded into the old car by 6 a.m. and went us on our way to the field. We made our work quite competitive to keep it interesting. We would generally take a 15 minute break around 9.30, pick again until noon and end the day around 4 p.m. Depending on how badly the crop needed harvesting. When we got home, there were baths to be taken and dinner to be cooked, many chores and cleaning to be done. We'd go to bed very tired, but also thinking of another tiring and competitive day ahead. We, we, as, we as young people made many friends from far and wide and looked forward to seeing each day. Postcards were printed of hop picking in hop yards, a sign of the significance of hops to the to state's image. So who picked? There were Indians from nearby reservations came in their regalia and the state's ethnic groups, largely recent immigrants to the valley were all represented. There were Chinese Americans, there were Swedes, Armenians, Germans, Dorothea Lang documented pickers for the Farm Security Administration in 1939. During the war, there were Bracero laborers from Mexico. There were nuns from Mount Angel. The Women's Land Army picked, as well as soldiers from Camp Adir, there, as well as prisoners of war. And I don't have any photographs of them because it was illegal to take pictures of prisoners of war. There were co-eds, as they were called, from OSU. We went on, we, with Tia's help, we actually learned the names of these women from the, so their photo in the Oregon State yearbook of their sorority and we got all of their names. These were in fact the first pictures I found with women wearing pants. The work was long and hard, but there was also social gatherings and entertainment in the camps. There were movies and frequent dances. So the hops were picked, bailed, and then brought to the drying kilns before they sent to the breweries literally around the world. Here you see again, almost all the stages, the poles, the wires, the hops that are brought down. They've been picked, they're put in baskets, put in bales, then put on these horse-drawn wagons. Each of these bales weighs about 200 pounds. Al Hansen in his interview noted, a check boss and two helpers would help, would weigh the, weigh the hops after putting them in sacks and punch the baskets. A sack bus would throw the full backs in the wagon. The field boss who was in charge of seeing this was all done in teams and the drivers would then haul the sack hulls hops to the dryer. At the dryer, three men would unload the wagons by the kilns that were taken, done by dumping the hops on an elevated floor 20 feet from a burlap covered to blow the heat to the hops. The kilns were a lower level of uh, wood fired furnaces. The hops are placed on slats, the heat dries them and then the smoke rise out of the top. After drying for 14 to 18 hours, they'd be dry and ready to shove off to the cooling room and put into 200 pound bags, bales. Pickers receive from 80 cents to 100 pounds, uh, to 100, per 100 pounds, and it differed from year to year. Day workers got between 70, 20 and 75 cents. As a kid, he noted that he received between seven to 18 cents a pound. Every four pounds of green hops dried to one pound of dried hops, so no one made much money. After the harvests in 1930, there was a grand festival in the town of Independence, which has recently been revived. You can note the poster just over this man's shoulder um, in another photograph by Dorothea Lang. So that's the end of the images. I look forward to talking with Tia and any questions, but first let me thank the Oregon Hop Growers Association for their generous support 
which has allowed the press to produce such a beautiful and terrific publication. And also want to thank the press for their incredible professionalism through all stages of the project, from inception through editing, production, and now promotion, which is why we are now here. So thank you. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Kenny. That was um, so delightful to see those pictures. I don't have the book in front of me for all of the COVID reasons, um, but it was just, it was wonderful to see them. Look at that. <laughs> wonderful to see them um, in almost print form in my hands. Um, so I, uh, I grew up in, in Eugene, I grew up in Oregon, um, and my family has been um, in Oregon for a very long time, and they grew um, hops decades and decades ago. Um, and I started the Oregon Hops and Brewing Archives in 2013, and Kenny was actually one of, I think, my first researchers, um, and he was working on a, a project for sight lines. Am I remembering that right? Yeah. Um, and he asked me all sorts of really terrific questions about the built landscape of farms. Um, and it, I literally never thought um, of, of hop yards the same way again. Um, and so it was good that he was one of my early, um, my early researchers because it really changed the way that I, that I thought about those spaces. Um, and so thank you, Kenny, for uh, that, but also for writing this book. Um, it has been a delight to work with you. And as an archivist, um, it's really one of the, the delights of, of our work when we see people do research um, and then um, translate that research into such a lovely book um, that is so, it's beautiful from a photographic standpoint, but also a really interesting thing, I think, for, um, for researchers. So I look forward to sharing it with lots of people. <laughs> um, so uh, I also thank all of you who are here and I thank all of you who do work in this industry, who um, care about archives, who donate to archives, who support archives um, and support historical research um, kind of writ large. So thank you all for being here. Um, I started, like I said, the Oregon Hops and Brewing Archives in um, 2013. And um, my job is to collect and document the work of the people who are working in the, the brewing industries um, in the Pacific Northwest, the people who are working and um, running um, farms in the hop industries, but also the science that happens at OSU. Um, and we are really so incredibly lucky that they have done all of this wonderful hops and barley and beer research for so long because that's why we had these terrific collections um, to support this, this research. So I am going to um, ask, uh, I have some questions to ask Kenny, um, but you can also share those questions in the chat and then Marty um, will uh, feed those questions to me. Um, and then I will, I will ask them, we'll probably, Kenny and I'll probably chat for maybe 15 minutes-ish. We can chat for a long time. So we'll say we'll chat for 15 minutes-ish um, and then uh, we'll open it up to your questions. You ready to go, Kenny? Ready to answer my questions? <laughs> Um, why did you want to write about this topic? What, what led you um, to me in 2014, we'll say? Okay, um, so a little background on me. I mean, I taught, land I recently retired, but I taught landscape architecture and the history of landscape architecture uh, for the last 45 years. And I, one of my questions that always interests me is why does the world look the way it does? How did it evolve? Um, all levels, the urban, suburban, rural, wild landscapes. And when we moved to Oregon, I saw hop yards for the first time. And I described them initially as like a vineyard on steroids. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, and I was curious about them. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to do a little research. And that's what took me to you and to the hop archive and to OSU, which was right nearby and didn't know that it was there. Um, so it was, that was the initial interest of trying to understand this. Um, and then I and then I researched it. And I can tell you how I researched it because I think that's I think that's rather important. Um, and particularly any students that happen to be listening. I mean, the first thing I did was look at what any other research anybody else had done. And there are books about the his, wonderful book about the history of hops in the Willamette Valley, but largely from an economic point of view, others that tell the history more broadly globally. 
there's lots of guidebooks going back to the 19th century. I read all of those. Um, and then I worked, but I was interested in this photographic history um, and, and how that evolved. And I'd been interested in the photographs of landscapes for a long time. And the first book I did, which was a history of the Colorado landscape, uh, which had very different characteristics. But in doing that, we discovered that you could do a whole book on virtually any topic. The, the photographic history of America is so broad and wonderful, not just in terms of content, but in terms of quality, the artistic quality of the photographs. And hopefully people got a sense of that with the ones I just took people through rather rapidly. So I started at the OSU archive. Then I went to every archive essentially in the state, the we in Western Oregon where hops are grown. Uh, every county archive, every historical society, the, the Oregon Historical Society, the State Library, libraries in Independence and Salem and Grants Pass, Eugene, and discovered their collections and had incredible assistance from archivists, starting with Tia, but archivists I, I just love. <laughs> uh, and then Tia connected me to this amazing set of oral histories that had been done around the, in the 1980s. Uh, and they became, when I discovered those, that was critically important for me. Many years ago, I began a project with my students called, <laughs> called Environmental Autobiographies of people's personal relationship to landscapes. And in a lot of ways, that's what these oral histories described. And I gave you just little bits and pieces of that, which become part of the text background of the book of people uh, in many ways, largely reminiscing, uh, but describing their experience literally from being like a six year old picking up to growers um, and their experience with that. Another source I discovered was there is an amazing archive that has scanned and digitized every newspaper ever published in the state of Oregon. And you could search if you just punch in hops, well, over a million things will pop up. But I researched particularly the, the newspapers in the, re the hops growing region in the Willamette Valley around Salem and Independence and so on. Um, and then lastly, obviously, I visited places. I visited hop yards, I visited growers, I talked to people, um, and it's that combination of things. Does that get the answer to that? Yes. I'm still interested in them. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <Yeah. laughs> um, I uh, want to know what you get and why, what you, what you get from and why you use photographs. Okay. Um, well, first of all, people like, everybody likes to look at photographs. You know, when you, when you pick up the newspaper, the first thing you do is you look at the pictures. You pick up a magazine, the first thing you do is look at the pictures, unless it's the New Yorker, in which case you look at the cartoons first. But otherwise, people are gravitate to images and where it's part of who we are, I think, visually, and certainly part of the contemporary world. Um, I'm interested in them for a variety of ways. Pictures tell stories. They're historic, as a landscape historian, they're historical evidence. You can look at them, you can interrogate them, you can see what's there. So I look at these pictures and even the ones I've looked at dozens of times, every time I see more things. You look at the people, who's there, how they dressed, what are they wearing, what are they doing, what's their activity, what are their tools, uh, how are they arrayed in the landscape. Um, in a lot of these pictures, you look close most the, the ones the ones with individuals are a kind of portraiture, both individual portraits, but more often these group portraits that are a lot like graduation pictures where people are, uh, you can see the pride in people's labor as they're there. You see it the way they're standing, the way they're looking at the camera, the way they're arrayed themselves uh, as a kind of group. Um, and I think that's rather remarkable. And you see the people, you see their tools, you see the materials, and you can ask all those questions. Every picture has a dog in it, you know? And it's always one dog. I don't quite understand that. I wonder where the other dogs are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there are kind of, uh, I've been reading a book, a biography of Richard Avedon, the great contemporary American portraitist. A lot of these are great portraits. In the book, and I talk a bit about this in the book, as much as I could find, I tried to discover who the photographers were. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a series, there's the, you know, Dorothea Lang is a, as the famous photographer in the book, but there were photographers out of Portland, out of Salem, out of Grants Pass, 
out of Eugene, out of Springfield, who documented this landscape and documented this, uh, this activity. Sometimes clearly as a you know, planned group, everyone's out there, please line up. But also what we would describe generally as candid photographs of catching people at their labor. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that um, the, the giving name to photographers and giving name to the people in the fields can be a challenge. Um, and I think the, the, um, they're so useful and they're so powerful, but they also, while they are of groups, they can be of people that we don't know. So um, I think- Although I have to tell you, almost everyone I have friends in Oregon who's over 70, and I mentioned this, what I've, and I've, the last year I've told them what I'm working on, they say, oh, I picked tops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. picked tops, or I did this, or we lived there, or we, yeah. It was a common activity. Literally, schools were let out so everyone could pick. Mm -hmm. Everyone in town would go picking. This lit, the town of Independence went from a population of about 3,000 people to 40,000 people, uh, and we're all housed in these camps. So it's- yeah. um, Part of the cultural memory uh, of the region. And I think that's that shows, and so I think even if you don't have a familial connection to it like you do, uh, you look at images and you say, like, oh well, I used to be a kid like that, or this mm -hmm. is what I look like. You know? I have a question um, from Larry who um... no, I think I've lost it. Hold on one sec. From Dylan who asked about why there are um, so many photographs from this era. So um, part of what um, the, the impact of OSU was that they were just taking pictures of the agricultural work that was happening um, in the state. And that was part of their job as good people who were doing their jobs and writing their reports, which we appreciate that those people wrote their reports. Um, can you talk about um, what you found out about the people who were taking the pictures um, and like from, from a, not the individual people, but why were people taking these pictures well, in the fields? I, I think you can, you can look at this, if you want to think of it in a broader sense, there is a whole like genre of industrial photography. Uh, people in, in this region, millions, thousands of photographs equally uh, about logging mm -hmm. um, and great photographs. Companies take pictures. These, the, uh, many of these were huge, large operations of, you know, four or 500, 600, the largest hop yards had a thousand acres. Uh, these were large economic enterprises and they, uh, they would hire people to take pictures and, and document them um, and created albums um, which were distributed. They were part of their publicity. Um, some of these were, were used for, you know, as what we would think of now as promotional devices. Um, for individuals, both in two ways, for to sell their, th their product, but also to entice people to work, uh, to get people during the season, if you will, during the picking season, to show them what was available, what was a camp like, what was the work like, what was available. Uh, I also discovered, uh, I tried to look into not just the, the physical landscape and the people who were laboring, but also the, the elements that make it up, you know? There's thousands, where did the poles come from? Mm -hmm. uh, originally it was people chopped down trees and made poles. There was an industry for poles. There was an industry for wires. Uh, I was interested in, in quantity. How many, how many, literally, how many thousands of yards of wire do you need? How many bolts do you need? How many thousands of baskets? Uh, Portland had major basket makers uh, and bale makers. Um, you know, so all of, you, you might think of all these things as the kind of support industry for the activity, which ultimately leads to something that people are drinking. <laughs> yeah, which is the sort of fascinating, um, I, I, the, we, we see this merger so much more now between um, the product the, the crop and the product um, and that it, it wasn't it wasn't quite the same um, that kind of direct um, link of grower to brewer um, for lots of reasons um, but I yes I, I love that um, I love that I, I remember you talking a lot about twine and like the, the different places where those the, the supplies for the farms would come from. Well, 
for example, the twine, which is, I can never pronounce the word core, quar, C-O-I-R, which is the name of the twine. I can never pronounce it right. I think it's pronounced core, which is made from the inside husk of coconuts, okay? Uh, and now the major supplier of that in the world comes from 90% of it, comes from Sri Lanka. There's an international trade in this. Uh, and by the way, it is biodegradable. <laughs> Just people should know that. Mow it all in. Um, to answer Martha's question, um, the, the, the flowers um, are the sort of light green. So you see them in black and white um, for, the, for that cover, but they are, um, I feel like they're almost like the color of my post-it note. <laughs> they're, they're lighter green. Um, and then the lupulin, which is the, the, um, the parts that we like, um, those, those um, glands, oil glands um, are a brighter yellow. So they, they definitely are fields of green for sure. Um, uh, 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 and just, we've got so many great questions. Okay, here's one that I don't know anything about. Um, I know about prohibition. So prohibition did not stop hop growing um, because there was a war in, in Europe. And so we exported lots of stuff, uh, lots of product. So did not, the, the issues of disease and pests were a lot more of an issue than prohibition. What do you know about the impact of the Spanish flu? I feel like I haven't come across yeah. that at all. Yeah. I don't know, that's a great question. I didn't read anything, anything about it. And actually that's, the flu is right after the war, is right, after, right at the end of the First World War uh, and uh, was, was catastrophic. But in terms of the industry, I'm trying to remember literally the graphs, uh, it's at the ascendancy of the industry, partly because before that, the major hop growing areas in the world were first Germany, then Great Britain, which really was a major area, but beginning right after the war, America, America and Oregon especially becomes, they publicize themselves, but actually it was true. They were the kind of largest hop growing area in the world. Um, and this was partly because of the decimation of the war in Germany and also a disease, this downy mildew disease that hit the hop yards in Europe uh, and was killing them. And it did, hit, it did come to America later and then the, you know um and then ultimately one of the reasons the industry largely moved to the yakima valley was that part of the northwest was less susceptible to that disease which is now killed with pesticides and so on um but i haven't did not come across anything specifically uh, about the uh, the the uh, the flu, the Spanish flu. Yeah, I love the, I, I love the questions that <laughs> they're like, I don't know, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I think the place, to, if anyone's real, the place to look for it would be newspaper, the newspapers of the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Uh, there were also hop growers, um, their own publications uh, about growing, which also had a lot, obviously a lot of local news uh, of what was happening, literally to individuals, as well as to, 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 to uh, the different growers and the economic part of which they were, of course, very interested in. Um, another, uh, so another question is about whether um, most pickers would stay for the whole season or only come for a week or two. Will you tell the story uh, about the hop train? Okay, so there's the, most people, the answer to the first part, people stayed for the duration. The duration was three to four weeks. Um, and uh, who picked was literally the towns that were near the hop yards, whether it was uh, largely in the kind of central Willamette Valley or around Grants Pass area. Literally, as I in one of those quotes I gave, everyone picked. It was a universal activity. And you began picking at about age six. Um, you were less, you know, you, and you got pit, you got paid by weight. So they, you weren't, they weren't making a lot of money, but everyone picked um, or were part of the support group for picking, making food and so on. Um, and they needed, the population of the valley was not enough to have pickers. So there were hop trains, uh, which were special, hop, you know, special trains just for hop growers. Uh, they went out of Portland and brought people to the yards. Uh, and then they were picked up depending on which side with the side, the train generally was on the opposite side of the river. They would take ferries across like at, at, at Independence 
and then be brought to these camps. And the camps uh, were uh, generally tent camps, which some were put up seasonally. Others had a more permanent basis where uh, yeah, there were kind of wooden structures and buildings. And then the growers would provide that structure. They would provide water. They would generally provide wood for fuel for campfires so people could cook. Um, some of them were large enough that they had essentially cafeterias. And then I showed a, a little bit, at least one picture of, of entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, you know, there was movie, movie night. It's kind of like a lot, what a lot of people have been doing lately. Um, you know, entertainment, dances, people went from one yard to the other. Uh, they would come as families, whole families would grow. And the descriptions describe the experience of a bit like summer vacation. You know, it's like a working vacation uh, on the pleasurable side. On the other hand, this was hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, this was hard work. People wore gloves. Uh, they, you'd, get, you know, you'd get stung by insects. You'd get scratched. There's, uh, it, it's, it's hot. If you notice in the pictures, every single person is wearing a hat. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not out of modesty, it's, it's hot if you're out there all day. You know, it's hot and dirty. You know, it's hard work, but at the end of the day, people, uh, there was lots of socializing uh, internal to these groups and even amongst the groups. Mm -hmm. um, although you'll read people describing things like that certain groups kept to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the Native Americans kept to themselves or the Chinese kept to themselves or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and given that many of these were immigrant groups, they, you know, there was kind of language groups, mm -hmm. you know, German speakers, Swedish speakers and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you talk about um, those uh, hop harvests and how they were incorporated into, um, I'm stealing from Ben. Um, how they were incorporated into the seasonal communal rituals. Was this something that, um, are there other harvest festivals like this? Um, and can you talk a little bit about what makes this a special festival or what made this a special festival? Well, I think one of the things that made it special was it was so dramatic in the, in the areas, what it was. I mean, you know, you, if you live in this area, if you lived in this area, this was the kind of most dramatic crop uh, the activity, the physical activity engaged so many people. Uh, there were other crops, of course, that need picking and some of these people, individuals would go on to pick other crops later in the season and so on. Uh, but you stayed there, you, you, uh, you encamped and I think that's very much part of it. Uh, and it was celebrated in a lot of the pictures you see people with garlands of hops around, around their, uh, you know, kind of around, you know, around their necks. Um, and kind of literally dressing themselves in the plant. And it's such a unique plant. Hops grow between 20 to 20, it's a, it's a perennial vine of, which grows 20 to 25 feet a year. Uh, that's an unusual thing. Um, it's not a single apple or a pear or a peach or plums or grapes or other, heart, you, know, other uh, you know, other plants. So I think some of it has to do with the characteristics of it. But there are other harvest festivals. There's a great, you know, right now in Oregon, uh, coming up, there's a grape crushing, uh, you know, which is becomes, you know, a, a uh, you know, a local celebration or people are, or they're trying to bring it back as a celebration. Um, and then there were festivals with uh, hop, there was a hop queen, it's not surprisingly, there was parades at the end of things celebrating, uh, celebrating the harvest. And I think there's also a, a, a scale to it. Um, at one time you would ride through the valley and I was just riding through the valley literally this week. Uh, you don't see it any longer, but you'd see the, the, the kilns, the drying kilns and the hop barns as, as a basic you know, physical or architectural element in the valley. The same way you, you know, see silos at farms. They're, they're part of the character, were, part, were, were, were a dramatic part of the character. I know there's a few people here who are from Eugene who've climbed up Mount Pisgah um, until the 50s, if you climbed up Mount Pisgah and looked down at CV Loop and looked in every direction, all of that was hop yards. Everything you're looking at uh, with, with the, the poles and the wires and the vines um, and these, these great structures uh, of the drying kilns.
Um, my cat, who many, if anyone has been on a, a meeting with me, know that my cat uh, can be a problem and she's very loud and she's in the room with me right now. So sorry in advance for the whining of the cat. Um, Kenny, I want to um, hear you talk about your um, your visits to Hop Farm. So I know before all of this shut down, I'm so incredibly grateful and um, that you were doing your research or glad that you were doing your research when uh, we could still welcome visitors. <laughs> um, but talk about how you consulted the landscape that is here now and how you visited those farms and thought about the, the, in, the built environment and the crop as it is now. Well, I did it in several ways. One was before I was even researching this, just you know, driving through the valley and I take lots of photographs and use some of this in teaching. You know, I kind of had documented uh, hop yards from just bare earth to poles, to wires, to as they grow. And then this, you know, before harvest, these great garlands uh, that, you know, like that you'd see in a Roman temple kind of, you know, hanging across the landscape. So, I, you know, I would see that and, and document that. When I visited folks, what I was most interested in, well, a couple of things struck me is the scale. If you go to a major grower, I was looking, I was taken to their warehouse and their warehouse like inside was like three football fields. I mean, and with the, 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 the um, pops are now generally, the drying is now pelleted into these little pellets, which are then literally marketed around the world. Um, and a good part of the uh, beer and ale that people drink around the world is flavored with hops from Oregon and, and certainly from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, that was a surprise to me. What was interesting in talking to people was, um, first of all, there are multi-generational families going back four, four to five generations uh, that are hop families. Uh, and uh, that in itself, I think is fascinating. And that is, that's been, Kind of passed on from gen one generation uh, to the next. But I was struck by both the knowledge, people's knowledge, um, and there's a, a, a mechanical knowledge, an engineering knowledge, an agricultural knowledge, and, and very much a scientific knowledge. I mean, these places have laboratories, uh, and they analyze things, and they, they're careful about it, and they measure. And I was fascinated by when do you know when to pick? Because I read all this literature of like this, the, the uh, uh, people don't come to pick until it's ready to pick. Well, how do you know when it's ready to pick? And I read all these things and then I talked to these growers and they said, well, you know, you do this and it needs a certain percentage of that and lupulin, which, lupulin, which is the, the, the flavor, essentially the resin flavoring ever, er, evidence. And then they said, essentially, well, you pick it up and you go like this and you smell it and then it's ready. And I thought that was just absolutely wonderful. You know, it's like, we have all this, but it's like, if you, this is your life, you just know, you know? And it was, and literally the guy went like, ball, you know, you know, covering his face. This was before the virus. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, you know, I think, um, and then I did meet, I attended a meeting of the Hops Growers Association which is not a large number of folks, but uh, they are, are both knowledgeable and passionate and, uh, and, uh, and both, uh, both an economic and really is I think also a kind of social grouping uh, uh, of folks, in, in, large, in, at least in the Willamette Valley, of which I think there's others. There's grass seed growers, for example, in the Valley that have, they have people who grow mint, uh, where a very diverse agricultural landscape. I, um, this afternoon, took advantage of the fact that um, it was so beautiful and sunny and I cut down my hops today. Um, it was a terrible crop for me, which is weird since I'm here all the time. Um, but people would ask me, so you grow hops, do you brew? And I said, no, I just, I love to go out and I, that's why I grow them so I can rub and hold the smell. I love, I love that. It's a, it's a very, um, it's a wonderful smell, a wonderful reason to grow them. Another thing, just another thing that uh, I learned from this, in, in a lot of ways, any particular topic, but this is the topic, um, in some ways was discovering this culture, but also as a microcosm of Oregon history, uh, of these, the, the peoples who, who have populated uh, this landscape, 
uh, the relationships among them, uh, who was favored, who was not favored. Uh, hop growers at times actually would advertise they only wanted white pickers. And at the same time, they would complain that white pickers weren't as good as the Chinese pickers. I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the, the history is told in a variety of ways. Um, so, and I think you can kind of enter the history of any region through any particular lens. Uh, and, you know, this, this is one. Oh, for sure. And I think that's the, the photographs just so um, they lend themselves so nicely to that sort of visual um, comparison. You see, she's wanting to go out the window. <laughs> um, I have a question of my, my own. I've been asking other people's questions, um, but I, I love the, what surprised you? So we talked about this. These are the different ways that you can answer this question, Kenny. Your interesting research finds, your surprising research finds, your unexpected research finds. <laughs> um, well, the, 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 the largest find was I started this literally from a more narrow physical landscape interest. Uh, I was really curious about literally the structure of this landscape, you know, the poles, the wires, how you build it, how many there are, why this amazing geometry. I mean, it's, it's essentially this grid of, on a landscape, these dots and lines, if you just kind of drew it. That's what initially got me interested. Um, and then I discovered this amazing culture. Um, and that, that to me was the biggest you know, initial surprise and the deeper I got into it, the deeper I got into the culture of it. Um, so what started in some ways as a more narrow kind of landscape history became a history of the culture of this landscape um, and the individuals who, who, who participate in it, uh, you know, those who own it, those who you know, make money from it, which I was, others have written about that. I was less interested in the economic part, uh, but the experience of it. Uh, then as actually as a, landscape historian, I've always been, have a certain interest in, in temporary places. And there's some, um, these camps, and this is something I actually wrote about when I, 30 years ago, when I wrote my first book about Colorado, there is a particularly a West, American Western type of settlement, which is our temporary settlements, which we call camps. There were logging camps, there were mining camps. Um, and these are encampments, these that lasted about a month, but they're, the fact that they're even short lived, they, they uh, I think have a very important life, um, life at the moment, but also very important life uh, in those communities. Um, you know, everyone in those communities know where the camp is and, uh, and had memories of it. Um, and they're also a, a, a um, American historical type of what's known as instant communities. You kind of bring people in quickly and they establish something. Um, and these were uh, established and, and they didn't have all the elements of communities. You know, the kids aren't going to school there. This is not school time, which is one reason I think they are uh, nostalgic about it, <laughs> a lot of folks. Um, uh, it's it's uh, a break from your other, other, other work time. Uh, I also was, um, what I, when I first started looking at these pictures, I was struck by their quality. But the more I looked at them, the more uh, I saw images that I, that I found were just extraordinary. Uh, and I showed some of my favorites, but there, there's lots more. There's, you know, the, both individuals, um, everything from an individual, a photograph of an individual to couples and pairs, the relationship you see, you know, pairs of husbands and wives, you see pictures of families, then you see pictures of these groups of individuals, uh, ethnic groups or people just from the same town. Um, I find that that, that uh, yeah, absolutely kind of uh, fascinating. So all of that was, uh, you know, both surprising and welcome. Yeah, I um, one thing that I, uh, I I love is the pictures of people in well in fields, but I. I um, OSU has lots of pictures of hot field day. So there would be the, the whether it was um, visiting brewers from like national level brewers. So 1941, 1945, um, there's one of my favorite pictures ever is this woman wearing a black dress and heels walking through a hot, like walking down next to a hop yard. Um, 
it, oh, these, these sort of like capturing all of the different um, ways that people interact, I think is, um, it's terrific. I love it. Um, is the someone is the surprise of those folks. There's, I showed one picture of the, these two young women from the Women's Land Army, mm -hmm. who are actually in the Women's Land Army uniforms with their numbers. Uh, there's a picture I didn't put in because I couldn't put it of the person who was the national president of the Women's Land Army. She came and visited and she's of course not, not dressed for picking. Like, not at all. <laughs> um, and then discovering, you know, soldiers at Camp Adair, which was this uh, training camp near Corvallis, which when it was open during the war was actually the second largest city in Oregon uh, at the time. Uh, had over 40,000 40, soldiers trained there. And then it later became a, a, a prison of war camp for German and Italian kind of prisoners. So these, these other uh, connections, you know, and, uh, you know, not, you know, picking nuns, you know, it's not what you expect. I mean, flying nuns, yes. Picking nuns, I was surprised about. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and I think the, in the, the seven years that I have run this archive, I've um, done lots of events when I would actually talk to people in person um, and have done lots of oral histories myself. The ones that you were talking about were from the Benton County Historical Society. And I put a link to those in the chat um, where you can find all the oral histories. Um, but I think the the number of people who have come up to me and want to share their stories and fascinating stories, like they picked, but but then also this was the circumstance. Um, I do, I, I know we're coming up um, on our um, on our time. Um, I want to know if there are any differences that you noticed in. Um, based on whether a camp or whether a field or a camp was in. Um, the Grants Pass area versus up by Silverton? Like, were there geographic differences that you were able to notice like up and down the valley at all? No, I don't, I don't think really, not, not really. They, I mean, there are some climatic differences between yeah. the, those areas, uh, you know, what's a little wetter and a little drier and so yeah. on. Uh, but that would, that would be it. And the other is um, uh, the contact, the, um, the landscape content, context. Uh, I mean, the Willamette Valley is a big, broad, wide open valley uh, around Grants Pass and in that area in the Applegate Valley and so on. They were kind of smaller hop yards uh, within these, you know, kind of forested, uh, forested hillsides. You know, originally, and I find it's interesting, you know, we live in one of the great forests, great forest, temperate forests of the world. Um, all, every open land was cutting down the forests, you know, and the original first poles were go into the woods and cut down poles um, and just, you know, kind of create it, uh, create it there. Um, no, I didn't, but it's an interesting question of the kind of differences. Um, there was a major area around Grants Pass for a while and then that essentially died, died out. It was no longer economically viable, although now, Hop yards have now grown, you know, in other places. There are hops now grown in Bend, mm -hmm. uh, for example. And there was before um, mechanical picking, uh, hops, virtually many, many farms would have a hop yard, just a few acres of hops and so on. Once mechanical picking came in, uh, those people couldn't afford mechanical pickers. So you ended up with, you know, a few larger growers that continued and the kind of end of, you know, having a small hop yard as part of your farm. Mm -hmm. um, so there were, you know, you had fewer individuals in, engaged in it as a, as a grower. But now you've got a slight resurgence with craft brewing of individuals doing it both uh, for brewing and, and people grow hops as an ornamental plant. And given its characteristic, you can make it into any shape you want. So there are yurts covered in hops, there are tents covered in hops, there's pergolas covered in them, there's, they're almost like a hops topiary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have time, um, I, we're right at, so I just want one, one last question, because this is a good question, um, is about the, why did people pick hops. So why it was tough work, it was, um, it was a, a hard thing to do. So what drew people to the hop yards? 
I think everything from, on the one hand, you made money. Uh, and if you were good at it, you could make good money. You got paid by the pound. If you were a fast picker, uh, in a few, you know, in a few weeks, you could make money. A lot of the histories describe particularly families picking. And imagine this in the 20s. And imagine this particularly during the Depression. They would like, oh, I made money. I worked for three weeks. I made money so I could buy shoes for school. You know, I could buy gas. Uh, you know, it was just that extra, extra funds to, to help support you. That was a major, uh, a major kind of impetus. Um, you know, for the, and it kind of added to that, you know, very definitely. Um, and it also became in, in communities, it was, you know, like everybody's doing it. You know, it's like, this is, if you're in school, in high school, your entire class is picking. You're gonna be the person who's not picking. You know, you know, everyone in the office is picking. I mean, I mean, I'm not exaggerating here uh, in the numbers. And uh, and you're in, let's say, you're 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 in Portland, and it's 1932, and you're out of work. This is something you can do. Uh, so I think it's you know, there's combinations of things, and there are also those who did it as a social. Uh, you, you can be sure there were those who picked for an hour and then hung out. I'm sure that's the case. Yeah. And those who worked all day long and got yeah. really good at it, yeah. Well, and I, I again, I, we are at our at our time, but I just I I love your book because it shows there were so many different questions and there are so many different stories um, that come out of the the things that you selected to put in the book and the stories that you told. So I think the fact that we had such a, a sort of wonderful wealth of questions from our great audience, I. I didn't even ask most of mine, <laughs> um, but I think that I know that I, I can ask you offline, <laughs> um, but thank you so much for writing this book and for OSU Press for making the decision to, um, to publish it. It's been a pleasure and I'm delighted to be promoting it now. Can I add a word first? I want to just to thank everyone for uh, all the, there was over a hundred people on this. Thank everyone for coming. I could only see a few faces out there, so I couldn't wave to everybody. <laughs> and, and, and some that I know, and a few surprises, and the others I'd like to meet. But but thank you all. And uh, the the intent here was to give you a, a sense of what the publication is about. Uh, a few things. It was oh, it's in paperback. It's light. It's not expensive. It's gorgeous. It's you should get one for. You probably know somebody who drinks beer. They need it as a present. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but and thank Tia, by the way, thank you Tia and Marty, but Tia especially, who was uh, her archive, the archive that she runs was spectacular, but she was also my entree point to, to other archives. You know, you need to talk to this person, you need to talk to that person. So thank you. And we will talk more in person. <laughs> hmm. Marty, are you there? Who's in charge? I, well, Marty looks like she's frozen. So I will just say thank you, everyone. <laughs>